Good morning, everybody. Technically, how are you doing today on a beautiful Saturday? Everybody doing all right? We're so glad to have you. We have a nice crowd here today. Um, congratulations. You made a very good choice what to do with a Saturday, okay? Um, I have the privilege of serving on the Ihara team as one of the lead agents. My name is Ted Kawabata, and I've been able to sit through uh, quite a few of these seminars. To be honest, it's it's a lot of powerful information. I still learn every time. And so I think you're going to be very glad that you came and you're going to be able to walk away with here some, some very helpful, very powerful information for your family's future, okay? I want to do a quick uh, introduction. I'll let you know um, what we're doing here today. First of all, I want to introduce um, uh, the Ihara team staff that is here. You guys recognize Dan and Julie probably from either the newspaper or our swarm signs all around town. Um, but they are our captains and our leaders for the Ihara team. Uh, we also have Justice here, a uh, handsome man waving who handles a lot of our marketing. And then Dan Yamane is our operations director. And then Ryan Lowe was here earlier, one of our other uh, talented agents, but he'll be around here or there. And then we're also partnering today, as we often do, with Impact Wealth Solutions. We have Enrique and Troy. Um, they're incredible at what they do. You're going to learn a lot from Troy. He's going to be our second presenter today. Okay, there we go. Yeah, this is Dan. Uh, he's the leader of KW Real Estate Planner, which is a new community within Keller Williams uh, nationwide. Dan actually trains thousands of agents on many of the things you're going to learn today. He's, I could brag about him quite a bit, but it would feel awkward. Uh, he's really incredible. Um, we are the number one team in Keller Williams in Hawaii. Um, and he likes to always talk about being a 59-year-old surf rat. You'll enjoy talking to him today. Um, <laughs> Good morning. This is so weird. Can I sit next to you a little bit today? Okay, cool. Because I can see that. All right. So what are we going to cover today? I'm not sure because the clicker isn't working. There you go. What does the current market look like today? And many of you are kind of curious, what's going on in real estate? And where do we think it's going to go? Right. Um, for some reason, the clicker. Okay. How do you build wealth and transfer wealth? So Keller Williams Real Estate Planner, uh, as uh, Ted mentioned, is a new community where we train. Uh, right now, we've got hundreds and hundreds of realtors that we're training around the country. And really, if you ask yourself, what's a real estate planner? You probably never heard that before. We help people build wealth and transfer wealth through real estate. That's what we do. right? And you're, today, you're going to see how we do that. We're going to remove the burden of rental properties. And so if you have a property that could be a burden for some way, shape, or form, many times it's because of physically, um, maybe some of it burned down. <laughs> maybe some of it's not occupied. Um, or maybe you're worried about the children after you're gone. Maybe you're looking down the road and thinking, hmm, I'm not sure about little Johnny, right, <laughs> if he's going to be able to do this. Eliminating family disputes. You know, there's so many challenges that we've seen with real estate as it creates problems, right? In fact, we actually started family dispute resolution uh, services for our clients. We have our, our first one that's actually going on the market soon that they have been fighting for decades and now are coming to realization that um, there's a better path for them to come. So we were able to walk and coach them through that process so that everybody can win versus everybody loses. And we'll talk about minimizing capital gains taxes. We all want to do that, obviously. You know, people uh, who build wealth in real estate uh, realize that the number one enemy to building generational wealth is capital gains taxes. And we're going to show you how to get around a lot of that legally. Tips on building a real estate plan. What could that look like? Right? So those are what we're going to cover today. And then we're going to focus a lot on 1031 exchanges in Delaware statutory trusts. These are the tools that we use. 1031 exchanges is one of the least utilized tools in real estate in America today, mainly because people aren't aware of the options that it can provide, the solutions that it could provide to creating generational wealth versus just a one-to-one. -one. It could be many things that we've done. We've done over going on probably 300 1031 exchanges, and we've never failed one. We've never failed one. So now we teach this around the country to agents so they bulletproof their 1031 exchange to ensure that they never fail. 
<clears throat> so what does the market look like today? This is uh, new data uh, from February. Um, things are a bit down, right? We, we saw a peak. If you can imagine, and I'm going to show you a chart in a minute, um, two years ago, the market went up 20 and 25 percent each year over and over. We, we don't call this a decrease in the market. We call this a correction to the market because it just went up so fast, right? And so now the market's adjusting and correcting itself. As you know, that we, pe we passed the peak in December of last year, and we're seeing a, a correction to the market as we speak now. Um, a, a couple of things to point out. Not only the prices are down a bit on single family homes, condos as well, the number of closed sales went down dramatically and the number of days on the market went up significantly, right? This is, this is the shift in the market. Keep in mind, this is old data, okay? So this is from closed sales in February, but keep in mind that transaction, the, the agreement between buyer and seller was about two months earlier. So this is December. This is what we felt in December that's only showing up now. Okay. When we when we do a lot of real estate, we sold 125 properties last year. And because we have so much listings on the market, we have a very good pulse of the market. We understand what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen two months before it shows up in the newspaper. Okay. Any questions on the market? No? This will give you a longer period of, of mindset around what's happened. Imagine uh, blue lines being single family homes, red lines being condominiums. You know, back uh, in the, was that the late 80s where the Japanese came in and they started bigging up. That was the first peak here. What happened after the peak? It took a bit of a slide, right? It leveled off. From 2000 to 2007, we saw the largest creation of wealth in real estate up until the last two years. Look at this. This is outrageous. This has never been seen before because the government started printing money, started making it easy for people to do that, and this is what we have here. An increase in the market went berserk in just two years. We had a client that bought a home, military lady, bought a home, zero down VA loan, sold it 12 months later. After paying all the fees, the 7% of all the fees, she still put $85,000 in her pocket. That's outrageous. And I asked her, how long would it take you to save that level of money? <laughs> she said, I could never save that much. You did it just by investing in real estate. And this is how we teach people how to build wealth through real estate. Okay, this chart and things. This is what's happening in interest rates. And this is the reason why the market went crazy, right? Right? When you could get a interest, when you can get a loan for under three <laughs> percent, it was easy money, right? So people bought and they used it, right? And that's why it it shot up the market so well because it was, it was, it was the interest rate was quite a bit low. You know, the government wants it closer to six percent, right? and that's where it is today. And so that's this is what you're seeing today is normal, right? I don't know for some of you who are around saw when the interest rate was eighteen <laughs> percent. And guess what? People still bought homes, right? Right? People still bought homes at 18%. Will it ever go down to 2 or 3%? My guess is never. My guess is never. Where will it likely be? Probably 5, 6, 7%, okay. depending on the market. This is what happens when interest rates rise just 1%, right? So if you take 6% interest rate, what it is close to now, goes up just 1% to 7%. And you wanted to, to buy a property, and, but you want to, most people look at monthly payments, right? How much does it cost me every month? That's, that's affordability for that person, right? What this chart shows you that a 1% rise of interest rate, you lose almost 10% of buying power. Buying power. Yeah, it's significant. The amount of, of money that you're going to, the ability to buy, you can't buy the million dollar property anymore. You're looking at $900,000 property to keep the payment the same, right? So that helps people understand what the impact of interest rates. <clears throat> so there's two types of properties that are out there. How many of you own investment properties? Yep. A handful of you, okay. 
Uh, and how many of you own your own home? Primary residence, great. So what we tell people is there's two types of properties. There's a property you own that you live in that's your primary residence. Now the primary residence, the IRS gives you $250,000 capital gains tax exemption if you sold it off of the gain. If, as long as you've lived in it two out of the last five years. So if you've lived in your home two out of the last five years, husband and wife living in the property on title, if you bought it for 500,000 and you sold it for a million, you can take all that money out tax-free, all of it out tax-free. There is no other asset that you own today that if you bought it at 500,000 and sold it at a million, you wouldn't have to pay this. Real estate is the only asset that the government's gonna allow you to take that out of, right? And that's why people who are thinking of downsizing or moving out to a retirement community, we've been doing this for 17 years, that's why they understand this and they're taking advantage of it. They're taking advantage of that money that's tax-free, the gain of the tax free. Now, you live in that primary residence, you're making decisions based on emotion. You're making decisions based on uh, what matters to you, right? Your neighbors, your family, the, you know, the style of living you want, you're making emotional decisions on that. Well, then on the other side of the coin is there's a property you do not live in. We call that an investment property. How should you see that property? Like an asset. You should be measuring that property like an asset, just like any other asset you own, stock, bond, or otherwise, right? Now, if you sold that property, you'd be subject to capital gains taxes, right? At the state and federal level. For some reason, this isn't working very well. Did I skip that chart, Ted? We're having trouble with this. What happened to that chart that was in here? The, um, maybe let's see if we moved it past. Okay, anyways, we'll keep going. So what we often do for our clients is we'll do a current portfolio analysis with them. We'll sit down and we'll talk about your home and your investment properties and maybe, maybe your future plans of at the end of the day when you're gone, what do you want it to look like? So we start with your home and we've asked those questions, does it fit your current needs? If it does, stay there, <laughs> why move, right? But then your next question is, what do you think your future needs are gonna be like? And many of us understand and know that as we get older, we're gonna have some level of need or care, right? We're gonna, um, usually it starts physically, you know, our knees, hips, back type of things. If you have a two-story home, that's problematic, right? If you have a long distance from your car to your your house that's problematic. Um, then the next question is, where would you go next, right? And that's what we do is we help people plan on, maybe you're, you wanna plan for the next month, next year, or maybe five years from now. What could it look like, right? And that's all part of our, our portfolio analysis regarding their home. And then what next question people ask is, what do I do with my home, right? What do I do with it? Do I keep it? Do I rent it? Do I sell it? What do I do with it? Right. And so we walk you through this process of understanding what those options are, and you get to decide on what's best for you. Right. Our goal is to ask enough questions so that you can self-discover the best path for you, knowing what we know, how it could impact what you will do will help you get there. Then you look at your investment properties, everything that you own that you currently do not live in we do a thing called an asset performance test. What is an asset performance test, you might ask, is it's a cap rate analysis and a cash on cash analysis. What we wanna do is if you say, I get X dollars coming out of this asset, right? Minus all my expenses, what's my net operating income? And how does that relate to the value of the property? And if you kept the, if you sold an asset, let's say at a million dollars and you bought another one at a million dollars, didn't cost you a penny more, but you could generate more money, would you? Most people say, yeah. And that's what we help people do. We help them understand that you have more than one option, right? It depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to generate more money, we can show you how that can work, right? If you wanna uh, figure out how to transfer it to your children, we'll show you how that could work, right? And so knowing how you can see your investment property and the options you have will make a difference on how you move forward in your planning. And then lastly is generational wealth building. 
leaving a legacy, right? Figuring out how to transfer wealth uh, even today while you're alive, right? And at least maybe not the transfer of the wealth, but maybe the benefit of the wealth, okay? That's a little different. Who could benefit from it? Who would you like to bless? And how do you do that so that you're not taxed on that, right? And so we, we go through that portfolio analysis. We'll sit down. By the way, I'm um, not sure Ted mentioned, but um, all those cups up there, those are, if anybody at the end of this, you want to have a, a private session with us, a strategy session that um, is more current to you, that matters for you. There's no obligation. There's no requirement for that. There's no cost to it. Um, then, yeah, we can set up an appointment at the end of this, and then you can grab yourself a gift there. So current and future goals, you know, what are my current needs? What's going to happen when you're gone, right? A lot of people my age and, and older, I, I'm going to be 60 this year. Um, and and I, you, you start looking to the future. You start looking to what happens when you're gone, right? And I, I ask my friends who are my age and everyone older than that, my question is, how many good summers do you think you have left? Think about that. How many good summers do you think you have left? And, and what do you want to do with it? And who do you want to spend it with? And who do you want to bless? It changes the way you see real estate. It changes the way you operate. Because, you know, my, my parents just passed away this year. My mom passed away in September. My dad passed away last, last month. Last night we came, flew back from Vegas because this was our trip for my dad. He wasn't with us. But it gets you to think about life. It gets you to think about what matters most. Right? And that's what we do as a real estate planner. We get you to think about what matters most to you. right? Because time is limited here, right? So who gets what? <laughs> that's a question. right? Who gets what? I... It was so funny. We had a, a realtor now. I, I'm training realtors around the country, and this guy in Sacramento says, "Oh, Dan, don't worry. I figured it out." You know, I said, "I got three kids, and I got three properties." And I go, "Sounds like you figured it out." I got only one question for you: Who gets the first pick? Or should I ask, who do you love the most? And then, what happens when you're gone? How do the kids see that? And I ask him. At the end of the day, when you're gone, do you want your kids to love each other? He says, of course I do. How's that going to work out? Because the guy who gets the first pick is going to think everybody else thinks he, mom and dad loved him more. And now, that, now mom and dad's gone. So who are they going to blame? They're going to blame their siblings. And this is why we have family disputes all the time. This is why <laughs> it's job security for us, to be honest with you, because this is so prevalent in today's world. Why? Because we're on the brink of the largest transition of wealth in America. Baby boomers and our parents are passing on. That's who owns real estate. And then when the transfer happens at the end, is oh my gosh. You know, we even started a class, I think it's going to be next month, a class that um, um, helps people because, you know, when, if, if it's in the trust, it keeps it safe from probate, right? right. So and if it's not, then you're going to go through probate. But so many people who pass away, they you have it in a trust. How many of you have a trust? Okay. And you have a successor trustee when you're gone, right? You have that, right? Who trains that person to do what they need to do when you're gone? Nobody does that. Nobody does that. There's 21 things that you'll want to know that you know that they're going to need to know upon your demise what they're going to have to do. And so Think of it, you're going to be gone, and now it's the most stressful time for your family. And the person that you selected <laughs> to, to be your successor trustee, you never helped them figure out what they need to do. And we're here to change that. We're here to change that. We're here to educate your families on how, what, what they need to be ready for. Because there's two things we know, right? <laughs> there's two things we know will happen. We're really, Death and taxes, right? Those are the two things, and it's only a matter of time. So how do we plan and how do we prepare? This is what the real estate planner does. Helps you build wealth and transfer wealth, right? Then the next question is, what's your ideal timing of doing what you're thinking of doing? And then where do you start, 
right? Where do you start? So we'll do a current market analysis of the properties that you have. We'll basically take a look at um, how that looks like. And then if you sold it, what would your net proceeds be? That's the most important thing. At the end of the day, when that property is sold, what are you going to have left, right? You want to know that. Then you also have to understand there's a, there's a thing called taxes. Now, we're not CPAs. We're not that smart. Um, but you do have a CPA. And one of the things that we ask all of our clients to do is um, before you sell your home, your first piece of homework is tell me what happens, what's your capital gains tax liability, and I want your tax consultant to tell you that. Because I can I can give you a rough idea, and we do this exercise, gives you a rough idea. Um, but if, if bad shows up, and you're going to pay taxes, the IRS isn't going to come to me. <laughs> They're going to go to your tax consultant. So make sure you talk to him. But we can walk you through what that looks like. Um, I think we talked about it here. Capital gains tax. Um, cost basis is how we calculate gain, right? There's two types of cost basis. There's a step up in cost basis. What that means is you get it at the value of the date of death. Let's just say uh, your parents had a property, right? and you are the trustee of it, right? They passed away and it says upon their death, you get the asset. Right? You get a step up in cost basis, which means if they bought it at $25,000 and it's worth a million dollars today, you get the value at the date of death, right? Which means there's no gain, there's no capital gain. That's what you want. You, you want no capital gain. And so keep it in your trust, but if let's just say somebody convinced you to give your asset away. Let's say somebody says, or maybe your kids say, hey, why don't you just sign the title to me? Right? There's companies out there that, attorneys out there that uh, really like them. They build a model on Medicaid. Right? So give all your assets away. You can only have $2,000 and give your assets away. We had a client that called me after one of our presentations and she said, hey, Dan, I want to sell my house. I want to move into this. Ilima and Lejano. She lived in Waipahu. She wanted to go to Ilima and Lejano. Her husband had dementia. She had taken care of him for 20 years and she was exhausted. And she said, she came to one of our seminars. We showed her how we can help her downsize, declutter, move, set up her home, live the life that she could have, that she desired, and her husband's taken care of in memory care. Right? And she could live a normal life. Right. Well, I get there that one day and I say, who are these people on title? I don't see your name on your title. She said, oh, this is my son, my daughter-in-law, and my son-in-law. And I said, so what happened? You don't own the property. And she goes, oh, yeah, last year I went downtown and I signed some papers. I don't know what happened, but her kids trapped her in her own home. She couldn't sell her house. If she couldn't sell her house, she couldn't pay for the retirement community. Her kids literally trapped her in her own home. And it was horrible because I couldn't help her. I said, the only way I can help you is they give the property back. That didn't happen. So she had to spend the rest of her life taking care of her husband that had memory challenges and it got worse and worse and worse. And she could never get any help because she didn't have any money to do that. The money was in the house. So that's what happens on a carryover and cost basis, where if you give it to somebody while you're alive, you now passed on your cost basis. If your mom bought it at $25,000 and now it's worth a million dollars, but mom gave it to you while you were alive, you now absorbed her cost basis upon her death of $25,000. And from $25,000 to a million dollars, all of that's called gain, capital gain. And you're paying tax on that at any point in your life when you sell it unless you do a 1031 exchange and you don't live in the property. The problem with that is now you're forced to buy something else of equal or greater value. You can't take the money and do whatever you want with it, right? It's really important to understand cost basis. When we, one of, this, one of the first things we do when we sit with our clients is explain to you what that looks like for you. Um, then we calculate your capital gains tax, right? And capital gains tax is the state and federal level, uh, up to 20% on the federal level. I think it's actually 7.5% in Hawaii today. This chart has to be changed. Um, and there's also a thing called a, 
an uh, adjusted gross income. If your adjusted gross income is over four hundred thousand dollars, there's another three point eight percent on top of that. Yeah, it's a significant amount of money, ladies and gentlemen. People who are real akamai about money and wealth realize that this is the number one enemy to your passing on the most amount of money to your next of kin. Right? And understanding how it works and understanding how you can navigate through that is going to matter on how that works. So every state's different. There are some states without them, um, depending on um, – depends on the state. As we said earlier, capital gains tax, I think it's over $46,000, I think, of gain. Um, you go up to 15 to 20%. And then at the state level, I mean, this is an article, uh, actually a news story that came out. They're trying to increase capital gains taxes. I don't know if that's going to pass or not, um, but it is is talk on, at the state capital. So when, when you look at your investment properties, it's an asset that you measure. You measure it like any other asset you own. If you own um, stock in Amazon or Costco, what do you look at? You look at the rate of return. How much money is your money making you? Well, that's how you should be seeing your investment property. You should be measuring it that way because it's an asset. You're not living in there. You don't have any personal benefit. Then we should look at it that way. And what we do is we do an asset performance test for our clients to clearly understand that um, your, your, your asset's worth a million dollars. You're generating X dollars. This is the relationship between the money that's coming in to the value of the asset. Is this for your property? And here's what other options are. And if you could make more money, would you? The answer is almost, I haven't, said, haven't heard anybody say no to that yet. Um, and so we walk you through that process. We, the other thing we've done over the last 17 years is we got good at fixing up homes. We got, we got good at um, better utilizing real estate. Uh, how do you take a single family home and make it into more than one unit, right? How do you fix up a home that maybe you want to live in longer, right? I'm actually a CAP certified specialist. I'm a certified aging in place specialist. I'm trained by the National Home Builders Association to help people stay home, in their home. And you may wonder, well, how does that help me as a realtor? It doesn't. We don't do it for me. We do it for people that we care about because at some point you care enough about people People will care about you, and to me, that's the simplest way to live life. Is you know, come from contribution, and the world shows up around you. Right? So, what we look at is how do you get the most bang for your buck on your investment property? Right? Whether you're fixing it, whether you're you're selling it, whether you're renting it, how do you maximize that? And then we go in and with our background in in fixing up homes, uh, we do some level of construction management services. We have about. <clears throat> I think five or six homes now at any one time that we're fixing up for a client. Right? We have a, I'm not a general contractor. I have a partner that's a general contractor. They have a business. We've been doing this for eight years with them. Um, it's an incredible amount of because we also buy and flip homes as well, right? So we've been doing this a while. We understand how to make money in real estate um, and what you need to do to spend the least amount of money to get the most amount of return on your money. Right? And we'll do that for people that don't want to use us to say if you if you have a niece or nephew you want to use fine um, for us to do that services is 10 percent, right it's a fee right for our clients though we do it for free right it's a service we provide so what we do is we walk in we do a scope of work we say here's the things that you could do right and then we get a cost estimate on that in writing if you did this here's how much it would cost and then if you did that here's here's the value today at the current position and condition your home is in and then we do an ARV after repair value, how much we think we could get for it. And we'll be very honest with you if it's, it's worth it or not. It may or may not be worth it, right? And you get to choose. But we're going to give you enough data so you can understand how to make the best decisions on your rate of return on your, on your investment, right? And this is what I kind of really enjoy doing. <laughs> I do this all the time. I'll, we walk in homes and, yeah, we just, yeah, we do this a lot. It's fun. Here's an example of a property we did. This was a kitchen that turned out to this. <laughs> this was a bathroom that turned out to this. We took out the walls. We, right, we made it open. We, a lot of walk-in showers. Today's market loves walk-in showers. Today's love, loves open 
air kitchen, right? Open floor plan. You know, we, we basically designed this from this and we designed all of this and we got the work done in about seven weeks. Yeah, all of that got done. Right? Um, so these are the things that we enjoy doing. It's super fun. <clears throat> Here's a chart that's really important for us to share with younger people. You know, younger people today, they're the microwave generation. That's a real thing. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know any young people, but that's a real thing. They, they, they want instant gratification. Well, real estate doesn't play that game. Real estate has a compounding principle to it. And the reason we do that is we, we show them this. Let's just say you're paying $22.71 a month. This is a real example, right? On a half million dollar property. So here's a guy that's renting and he's paying the same amount of money every month as the guy who's bought. So he's paying 2,200 bucks a month, both sides. Except this side, the guy who bought got a gift of $100,000 from mom and dad. And they, they, they invested. How much does this guy own in 30 years? Zero. Now look at this. $1.62 million. It's because every year when that asset grows four or five percent or 20 or 25 percent, right? I can't tell you what that's going to be. My crystal ball broke on the way here, but it's going to go up. History, history tells us that history is going to repeat itself. Isn't that staggering? But, but young people need to see this. And when they do see this, they go, Poof, okay. Like they say, when's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. When's the next best time? Now. <laughs> so what are you waiting for? And what if you could bless and train and coach and, and motivate your children to build wealth through real estate? What if you could change their life? We, I just talked to an, an agent yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday. I was in, where was I? I was in Las Vegas yesterday. And I was talking to an agent and she said her family had never owned real estate in her entire life. She learned how to invest in real estate. She bought her first home. Nobody in her own family ever owned their own home. They were all rented, right? All rented. And now she's looking at investing in a property. And now she's teaching her children this. And when I showed her this, she says, I'm going to show this to everybody I know because this is powerful. It's time. That's your friend, right? And that's why it looks like in this chart, right? In the first couple of years, it's not that much growth. But what happens, it's exponential over time. If you think of Warren Buffett, he made more of his money after the age of 50, right? Because of time. Right? It's a principle of a compounding. So the other thing is, is about teaching your, your next generation how to build wealth. We'll do an, um, a current portfolio analysis for you. We'll start with a, creating an end in mind. What do you want it to look like at the end when you're gone? Understanding your family goals are really important. Like your kids, who needs help? How do you help them? How do you help them today? My, I ask everybody that I meet, it's like, if you, I ask them, so why do you have this wealth in real estate? And they all say the same thing. It's for my kids. And I say, so what's your plan? I said, well, it's in the trust. They'll get it when I'm dead. I said, so my question for you is, if you could bless your kids today while you're alive let, or watch them fight after you're dead, what do you want? What if you could bless your kids today while you're alive and receive the gratitude and, and love from your family today? It's a good thing. And that's what we're doing around the country now. We're changing lives all over the country because we're changing the way you look at real estate. Changes the way how you how you manage and plan your real estate. Then the next question is, what are your next steps? Who, what, and when within those next steps? I'm struggling with this thing. It might be the battery. So let's talk about changing gears on a 1031 exchange. What it does is you have an investment property. If you sell it, you are, they allow you to defer your capital gains taxes. As long as you buy something of like kind, right? Um, what is like kind? Uh, eventually, I'll get there. We probably need another battery in this thing, guys, because uh, it's not working. What is like kind? It's all of these things. It's all of these things. 
So when, when people hear the word, well, I got to buy, if I sell a condo, I got to buy a condo. No, you can buy a theater if you want. <laughs> you can buy a shopping center. You can buy anything. You can buy a Delaware statutory trust. That's oftentimes, and we're going to talk about that deeper, and one of my good friends here is going to show you the creation of plans that are really helping people get to their goal. There are a couple of rules. Um, it has to be in the United States. Yep. And there's a thing called a, a non-related party, right? Because the, the goal of the 1031 exchange is the government saying, I'm giving you a pass on your gain off your investment property as long as you stimulate the economy and buy something of equal or greater value. That's why it happens. And so you must de designate your replacement property within 45 days, and you have to close within 180 days. Okay. That's kind of the general rule. The most important thing is the 45 days. This is really how we've never failed. This is how we bulletproof. This is what we train real estate agents around the country to do. You have two transactions on a 1031 exchange. You're gonna sell and you're gonna buy of equal or greater value. As you're selling a property, you're also looking to buy another replacement property. So let's just say somebody meets with us, which we have a number of clients that are doing 1031s today, that we meet with them and they, we aggressively sell it. While we're aggressively selling it, we're gonna start looking already. Why? Because you don't want to start looking here. <laughs> That's too late. Right? Because once you once you get into an agreement, you should be able to write offers already for the replacement property. It'll take 45 days to close, and then you have another 45 days to assign your replacement to it. That's why we've never failed. Some people start here. That's a bad plan. <laughs> I'm just telling you, that's a bad plan. I had a guy walk in on day 43, and say, I want to buy an investment property. <laughs> I said, did you, when did you sell? I sold 43 days ago. I said, wow, good luck. <laughs> he wasn't our client. <laughs> but did you have a question? What happens if you cannot sell? Oh, what happens if you cannot sell? Good news is you don't have to buy. <laughs> yeah, that's never been our problem. <laughs> we, no, honestly, it hasn't been our problem. Because we show you how to sell it and properly to get it sold within a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, yeah. We've closed over 1,400 transactions. We know how to do this. We've done it a long time, right? So we'll teach you how to do that. Pricing matters, right? If you're priced too high, you're not gonna sell. <laughs> it's pretty simple. The, 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 the world out there is very, um, uh, I would say people are, are, are equipped with information. It's, it's in their cell phone, right? All the data is available today. It's different, right? So it's a very efficient market we live in. If you're priced too high, you're not going to sell. If you're priced appropriately, at some point within reason, it'll sell. Now, when you get up to the you know five, six million and above, that's a little different game. But anything under maybe two million, yeah, there's a lot of buyers out there, right? So that's why we haven't failed. We, we're we're shopping here instead of shopping here. What that means is we got at least 90 days to find a property. It's usually four months by the time we start it because we're going to start looking here. <clears throat> we had a guy that liked this. In fact, he came to one of our seminars and he said, I only want Mililani Malka, the end of Mililani Malka, um, and I want a four bedroom house with a large closet for my wife. And he says, That's really rare. I don't want to do this. But can you help me? I said, yeah, we did. So we actually sent a mailer out. Guess what? We found his home for him. We literally found the home before it was going to hit the market. He was on the process of selling his property, and he bought his dream home that in about three years he's going to move into. He's going to change his intent of ownership. Right? And you can do that as well after two years. And so we're, and then we're going to sell his primary residence. It'll pay off his mortgage, right? and he'll live in the ideal home for the rest of his life. Yeah. These plans can be constructed, and they may not happen overnight. But what we've seen is we've done a lot of them, so we can help you design your plan. Right? Well, a Delaware statutory trust is the next thing we're going to talk about because it's a great solution for our clients that have investment properties that don't want investment properties, that don't want to pay tax, that the property is a burden, 
but they want income. And if that's you, you're going to want to pay attention to my friend here, Troy, because this is what it looks like. You must be an accredited investor. He's going to talk about that. Uh, it has. It is approved by the IRS for a 1031 exchange, and there's no property headaches. There's no management headaches. See, we we had a condo in uh, Alawai Skyrise Plaza, and um, it was the beginning of COVID. You remember when COVID, the law was if your tenant loses their job, you couldn't kick them out. That scared the daylights out of me. <laughs> so I sold mine and I put it into a Delaware statutory trust. I kind of got tired of the calls about the, the toilet and then about the washer and dryer and the water heater. I just got tired of it, right? But here's the funniest thing. Now I'm a realtor, so don't, hold, don't be judgmental here. But I run my asset performance test on it and I made 2.1% return of my money. 2.1% return of my money. Because right? I didn't look at it for a while. I didn't pay attention to it until COVID showed up and I started paying attention to it. I realized that, holy smokes, that's not real good. We sold it. I put it into it. I went to Troy. I went to uh, Troy, helped us get a DST, a Delaware Statutory Trust. I now make 4.49%, almost 4.5%, twice the amount of money with no headaches, with no hassles. The money just shows up. I kind of like that. I don't know about you. I, I like this because right? there's no, there's no hassle to it. So, All right. Can you guys hear me okay? I was told I need to talk in this mic and I normally talk loud, so I'm gonna try not talk so loud. Um, but as Dan mentioned, my name is Troy Wada. Uh, the company I started back in 2013 is called Impact Wealth Solutions. Uh, if you haven't heard of us or you haven't seen me on Living 808 once a month, um, you might have heard of the partners we work with, uh, Hawaiian Electric and their credit union. We signed the contract with them in 2015. So we work with the credit union, work with a lot of employees. Prior to COVID, I was doing about 100 plus classes on your guys' work site at Ward, Downtown, Hilo, Kona, Waimea. Um, and then because of that relationship, we signed a similar arrangement in 2019 with Hawaii Financial Federal. The same work we did with Hawaiian Electric. They wanted us to do it Hawaiian Air, Hawaiian Tel, Honolulu Border Water Supply in Queens. And we do something similar for the city county employees of Kauai as well as the Big Island city and county employees. Bank of Hawaii Investment Services is also our client. I don't know if you guys know this, but Bank of Hawaii has financial advisors like me over there too. Um, they have about 17 of them. We advise their financial advisors on things like life insurance, long-term care, disability planning, asset transfer planning, and things like that. We signed a contract with them in 2017. But as Dan mentioned, uh, the Delaware Statutory Trust is something that we've had to become specialists in um, since about 2013. But prior to today, how many of you have ever heard of a Delaware Statutory Trust? Wow, we got two. That's that's more two more than I normally get. So that's pretty good. How did you guys hear of a DST before? Volkers. Angle Volkers. Okay, Mukai Gawa. Okay. Yeah, um, she's a realtor, but yeah, that's something that she does. Yeah, yeah, that's a DST, correct. How about you, ma'am? How did you hear about that? From your accountant. Wow. Most accountants don't know that what a DST is either because there's hundreds of thousands of internal revenue codes right, and internal revenue procedures. And the one specific to the DST is 2004-86. So unless your CPA actually knows that internal revenue code, they don't know where to find it. You know, but being that we work with, you know, thousands of clients now across the U.S., we have offices in Pasadena. I have an office in Pittsburgh that I go to once a month, as well as on every island, you know, in Hawaii. Um, we serve thousands of clients. A lot of them own real estate Right. And as Dan mentioned, it was one of those ways that people accumulated wealth, especially here in Hawaii. I mean, if you, as Dan mentioned, if you just had real estate in the last two years, you've, you've increased your wealth, right? Uh, because what happened to prices in COVID? Now, let's figure this. Now, whenever we talk to our clients, you know, and they come in with us, and, and I, as you can imagine, I'm a registered investment advisor. But what I do at my firm is we're a, a boutique wealth management shop. So we sit down with our clients, we build holistic financial plans, and we work either with their tax professional, legal professional, like an estate attorney, CPAs, realtors, lenders, mortgage brokers, whatever. And we work with them and we build this comprehensive plan. So whenever we sit down with our clients and we ask them, okay, so tell me why you have this real estate investment. You know, why do you own real estate? 
we're going to get very similar responses, right? Either it's because they want income, and as Dan mentioned, that's called net cap rate, right? Or cash on cash return. Um, any of you read the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Robert Kiyosaki? Only a couple of people. Yeah, Robert Kiyosaki was one of the first books my grandmother forced me to read. I had to write a book report on that thing for her, you know? And funny enough, Robert's nephew now works for me in my office, you know? But talks about multiple streams of income, and that's one way to build wealth, right, is to own real estate. Estate planning then touched on the step up in cost basis, of course, diversification, taxes. You know, real estate comes with tax benefits from an investment perspective. So when you collect rental income, because what happens to an aging building when you own real estate? Depreciation. And depreciation is basically the technical term for your building loses value every year, right? Because an older building requires more maintenance and upkeep, right? So the IRS gives you a tax break for that. And what they say is that because your building is losing value every single year, whether you like it or not, right? You get to take advantage of some of those losses. And that's called depreciation, which is why if you own a real estate investment, if you look on your tax return, you'll see a form called a Schedule E. That's where your CPA puts that losses on your form every year so that you defer some of those taxes that's owed against that income that you're collecting because passive losses offset passive income. Does that make sense? Okay. So depreciation is one of those benefits that you get from owning real estate. And of course, lastly is depreciation. But as a registered investment advisor, what is the one thing that we have to tell our clients? Every investment that comes with reward comes with risk. Right? It's called risk reward correlation. So what is some of the risks associated with real estate? I like to call them the terrible T's, the tenants, toilets, trash, TROs, Hawaii, we add termites to that list. Um, and I've been doing this for 10 years. Um, and you he, he heard Dan mention he did about 300 1031 exchanges right in his career. We do about 300 1031 exchanges a day. I mean, a year, I'm sorry. Right. So a little more than one a day is kind of what we do. We've never had a fill 1031 exchange. And over the years, we keep getting to add more T's on there. You know, torching, right? All these crazy things you wouldn't believe. Estate planning, Dan talked about, you know, what happens when you have three kids that own three properties, right? Yeah, you got to ask them, well, which kid you love the most, right? That's the one you give them the most expensive property. But what happens when you have three kids that inherit one property? You ever heard of that? Right? Usually you got the kid who read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He wants that multiple stream of income. He's going to keep the property, right? Fiscally responsible, right? And then you got the kid who's a spendthrift and loves Las Vegas, right? What does he want to do? Want to sell his property, go Vegas. And then you got the third kid that's living in the property and not paying rent, right? And because none of them can agree and because they hold title tenants in common and they all have to agree because they're forced to be in business together, right? What happens? Everybody loses. They sell. Right. That's the definition of compromise. Right. Everyone loses. OK. Now, is keeping all of your real estate in the same zip code the best idea? Not necessarily, especially for me. I grew up on Kauai. Right. And my family, we had all of our real estate on Kauai. So you can imagine what happened to our real estate between 1982 and 1992. Two hurricanes in 10 years, completely wiped out. Right? Had to rebuild everything again. Now, of course, properties with a mortgage, right, that is vacant is losing money. We talked about the maintenance upkeep of a building, potential of a fill 1031 exchange. You know, no one ever wants to be forced to pay the taxes. There was only one time in history that this 45 day period and the 180 day, uh, 45 day identification, 180 day close period was adjusted in our nation for the 1031 exchange. And that was in COVID because people couldn't go out and look at properties. Right. So they extended it a few months for people to ID. Will that ever happen again? Eh, we hope not. Right. We hope nothing like COVID ever happens again. Um, real estate in general is illiquid. But as Dan mentioned, when we look at our cash on cash return here in Hawaii, it tends to be very low from a percentage standpoint. And of course, that makes sense. Right. You can have an investment that appreciates the fastest and pays the most income because there's two facets of return and how you make money in real estate. It's income and appreciation, right? So here's a typical return for a property um, here in Hawaii. Now this is located at the collection. You all familiar with that condo building, which is right by restaurant row. 
right? A three bedroom unit in there goes for about 145, 1.45 million. And with a $600,000 mortgage, even though this person is collecting 4,300 a month in rent for his three bedroom unit, which is about 1,100 square feet, he's losing 1,700 a year, okay? You guys see that? The $600,000 mortgage, not to mention, has a 3% interest rate and his monthly payment is $25.29 a month. Now, for the math majors in the room, what you'll notice is that the mortgage payment is the biggest expense, right? And that is eating his rate of return. So for those of you that own property, investment property, raise your hand. We had a few of them, right? Any of you own your property without a mortgage? Okay. So without a mortgage, your property does better, right? Okay. So when we look at this property without a mortgage, he goes from negative 1700 a year to positive 28000 a year. How many of you want that investment instead? Raise your hand. Most people, right? Okay. But that's a whopping 1.97% cash and cash return. Right? How many of you want 1.97%? Can go to the bank now, get a CD for four. Right? Okay. So how do we solve this problem? How do we solve these problems where people own real estate investments that have highly appreciated, especially in the last two years, right? And there's this huge demographic. And, and take a look around you. You guys are, most of you are all part of the silver tsunami. You guys know what that is? Yeah. The baby boomers, right? You guys are all aging and in their golden years. Now you want to enjoy retirement, right? How do you solve this problem where you have this highly appreciated asset? You're no longer working. You want more income from your asset, but you don't want to pay the taxes. That's where the Delaware Statutory Trust might come in. Okay. Now, what is a DST? A Delaware Statutory Trust is a way for 500 accredited investors to pool their money together with the intent to buy bigger, better property. And as Dan mentioned, it qualifies by the IRS to do a 1031 exchange. Now, what can we buy? We can buy something like an Amazon distribution center in Thornton, Colorado, which we bought for about $100 million. We can take Dan's million. We can take, you know, um, Nadine's 10 million. And I can take Wayne's 100 million or 50 million and we put it all together and we can go buy this building. Okay. And because it qualifies by the IRS for a 1031 exchange, it allows you to defer 100% of the taxes when you go into these kinds of programs. Right. Now, why do some of our clients love the DST? Number one is because we know that most people own investment properties with a mortgage, right? And the number one rule in a 1031 exchange is, as Dan mentioned, you always have to buy equal to or greater than the value that you sold. So if you sold the property for a million dollars with a $500,000 mortgage, you need to go buy another million dollars of property. You don't take the 500,000 in proceeds that you would get and only buy 500,000 in real estate. Does that make sense? Right, that mortgage would be taxable. For that reason, we have DSTs that already have a mortgage on them. And because pursuant by the IRS, they can only be one borrower attached to every property in a DST that will always have to be the sponsor company. Because can you imagine trying to qualify 500 people for financing? That would be crazy. That wouldn't work, right? So they only allow for one loan, one borrower to be put on every single DST. Therefore, when people invest in these programs, they don't need to qualify for the mortgage. Therefore, they cannot be held liable for the mortgage. It doesn't even show up on your credit report, right? The loan is what we call non-recourse, right? Basically, they cannot come after you for the debt, okay? And you can do some very interesting things with that non-recourse loan, and we'll show you some of those things that you guys can do today. We can many times increase the rental income. In Dan's case, we more than doubled his rental income. We get you out of the management, right? Get you out of the terrible teas, the tenants, toilets, trash. So you can have more terrific teas, like time with the grandkids, time on the golf course, tennis, right? Those things. Um, we can continue to defer all the taxes using the 1031 exchange, but now you get access to institutional quality real estate. Institu institutional quality real estate tends to be more stable in pricing because there's a smaller market for it. Yeah. Now, Lower minimums, about 100000 You can diversify your real estate, not only geographically, but by the type of real estate you own. We can own things like an Amazon distribution center, multifamily, student housing, medical office, headquarters for Jay Lang LaSalle's office in Houston, Texas. We could own that thing too. Um, from an estate planning standpoint, we've been really busy with the DSTs lately, 
mainly from the estate planning standpoint. Remember those examples with the three kids that inherit one property, right? With a DST, it's not tenants in common, it's fractional ownership. So when each of those three kids inherit their percentage of the DST, they can do whatever they want with their with their interest in the DST. They're not in business together. For the kid that wants to keep getting the rental income because he read Rich Dad Poor Dad, leaves his money in there, keeps getting his rent checks. For the kid that wants to go to Vegas, cash out, takes his proceeds, go to Vegas. The only kid out of luck is the one living in the property and not paying rent. Okay, He cannot go to the Amazon distribution center in Thornton, Colorado and say, I own the bathroom on the third floor. I'm going to move in. Of course, they're not going to let him move in there. Okay, But he could take his proceeds, buy something else. He could take the income and rent something else. Okay? Give him more options. So as I mentioned, we do about one a day, at least one a day. 1031 transactions, right? And I've never had a failed 1031 exchange ever. Even when clients call me on day 43, out of day 45, looking for properties. So we always act many times as a backup so that, remember you can list three properties on your identification form. If you specify that one is a specific DST and those other two don't work, just exchange into the DST to defer all the taxes, okay? Now, of course, because a DST is real estate and like kind property, assuming it is titled correctly, it is also subject to the step up in cost basis. Remember that example where at the date of death, we perform an appraisal. That's what the kids new cost basis is. Same thing happens to the DST. Okay. So <clears throat> non-recourse loan, simply put, is a loan that you can't be held liable for, right? Because you never have to qualify for it. Okay. It's non-recourse this is important, as I mentioned, because we need to ex we sell a property with debt. We need to replace the debt either with another mortgage or we need to add cash. OK, we cannot not replace the debt because if we don't replace the debt, example, in that collection unit and we actually sold that property for one point four five million, but only took the proceeds of eight fifty and only bought eight fifty in real estate. That would trigger a one hundred eighty one thousand dollar tax bill. Okay, by not replacing that six hundred thousand dollar mortgage, does that make sense? Okay, but what's the problem? We took all our proceeds, right? We took all the eight hundred fifty thousand. We threw that into the next property. Where did we come up with the hundred eighty one grand? Well, some of us might have it laying around in cash, right? Very few, or we got to go get another mortgage on this one to pay the tax. Okay, which of course we never want to do that. Okay. The loan is already predetermined and already on the DST before anyone ever invests in it. So example, we might buy this $100 million Amazon building in Colorado for $100 million. We'll add a $50 million mortgage on it. And maybe that mortgage will be 10 years interest only fixed for that period of 10 years. And in today's rates, it's like about 4.75%. Okay. All right. But the income that we pay off a of DST is net after all of your expenses, the mortgage payments, the management, the maintenance, the upkeep, the accounting, everything. The rent checks we send on the eighth of every month is net of all fees. That's your profit, okay? All right, so in this example, what this investor should have did, right? Instead of only taking the proceeds and only moving the proceeds into an investment property. He could have actually gone into a Delaware statutory trust that had a 50% loan to value, okay? And what 50% loan to value means is that 50% of that total property we buy, example, $100 million Amazon distribution center, 50 million is equity and 50 million is debt, right? That's that 50% loan to value. So if you put in 850,000, which is 50%, which is the equity, that means he'd be able to participate and use 850000 of this non-recourse loan that he never had to apply for, was automatically approved, won't show up on his credit report, and he's not fiscally, fiscally and legally liable for. Okay, He would buy $1.7 million worth of real estate in that Amazon distribution center. He would own 1.7% of the $100 million. Does that make sense? Okay. The DST would pay him about 42000 a year in income compared to his negative 1700 Not to mention, he was able to defer 100% of the taxes because he used a 1031 exchange. Does that make sense? What happens on depreciation? He restarts it, actually. Because what happens, if you look at it, he sold for 1450 
he increased his building value, right? By 250,000, that's added depreciation he can recognize from our DST. So that's the other benefit of the DST. You get to participate in the depreciation aspect too. And we send you a 1099 so that it always comes on time. Yes. What does it show? 850,000, right? Actually, it's going to show a little bit more than that because we will credit you a portion of our commission. And on the closing statement that you get, that you give your CPA, will show about 1.7 million worth of real estate. So 850,000 goes in. Yes, sir. You get a percentage of, no, it's not tenants in common, fractional ownership. We don't want tenants in common, that's why. And the reason why we don't want tenants in common is because everyone gets a voting right. Everyone has a say. And the problem when you give people voting rights, no offense anyone, they vote in their best interest, right? The mandate of the DST is that it needs to be managed in the best interest of all investors, not just one. Closing statement, percentage ownership of the trust. The trust owns the property. You are a beneficial interest owner of that trust. Yeah. You do. The trust owns the property. You own it through the trust. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. On the debt service that you're talking about from your, your existing CDPSP, mm -hmm. can you make a decision that you want to increase the debt? Yes. Just depends on which DST we go into, right? Every DST will have varying amounts of debt on it. Depending on which DST we want, we might not want any debt. We can go into a DST with so no mortgage. Can I say I want more mortgage so I get a bigger? No, only because the mortgage is already 50 million on the 100, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Right. So you can always participate in the 50, okay. right? Okay, good questions though. Okay, so how can a DST help you? Right. Any of you own a home that was burnt down that you need repairs? Yeah. Don't want to fix it. <laughs> right. Yeah. He, God sent him for a reason today. <laughs> okay. So, you know, here's the example of my client that basically had a property in St. Louis Heights that she grew up in. Right. And, and my client now is she's, she's in her late seventies. Okay. So she grew up in this home as a kid that was built and she lived in there in the forties. Okay. Her mom put her on title when the mom was alive for Medicaid planning, right? Because she took a home equity line on the property to purchase the condo she lives in Kaka'ako now, right? Her net income after her mortgage payment is $2,400 a year or 200 bucks a month, okay? Now she needs to fix the roof, 1940s property. Of course, you got to fix the roof at some point. 50,000 bucks to fix the roof, 2,400 a year net profit how many years does it take her to pay off the roof any guess 20 something years right she's 73 years old she'll be 93 when she sees her first penny of profit does it make sense for her to keep this investment probably not right but what's the problem remember she was put on title when her mom was alive her cost basis was the price of the property that her mom paid for it thirty thousand bucks Minus depreciation, which is the value of her building because depreciation lessens your cost basis. So her cost basis on this was like 10 grand. Sells it for 1.1 million. She'll pay the taxes from $10,000 to 1.1 million. What's her tax bill? Enormous. Okay. So we decided we're going to 1031 exchange. Okay. Into a Delaware statutory trust with a 50% loan to value. Why? We want to restart the depreciation. Right. We'll give her a way to save more money on taxes on the income that we're paying her because we're going to pay her much more income. Her income is going to go from twenty four hundred a year to forty five thousand a year. Is that a better investment? Absolutely. Right. And we got to defer one hundred percent of the taxes because we use the ten thirty one exchange. OK. Now, what if you already did a ten thirty one exchange and you got leftover money? Right. And you don't want to pay the taxes on it. You know, this works well. Remember the minimum investment on a DSC is 100000 right? So let's say you sold a property for a million, you bought something for a 900, and you got 100000 left. What can you buy in Hawaii for 900000 Parking stall. <laughs> Parking stall and a storage, right? Depending what building you're in, okay? So this particular client sold an apartment building for $6.75 
that was paying her 130000 a year. She bought a second property for $4.5 million, all cash. Okay, because she wanted to get out of her older apartment building, much older, much bigger, more maintenance, more upkeep, wanted something smaller, easier to maintain. So she took four point five million in her proceeds, bought this newer one, all cash, that's paying her a hundred thousand a year in income. But what's the problem? She has one point two five million left in proceeds, right? Six point seven five million dollar apartment building. She has a million dollar mortgage. She pays four point five million for this one. After her mortgage is paid off, she's got $1.25 million left. But remember what the problem is in this scenario? We need to replace the mortgage. She's got $1.25 million left and needs to buy $2.25 million, right? She needs another million-dollar mortgage. And she calls me on day 43. Okay? So I told her, ah, no problem. I have a DST that has a 50% loan to value. Let's identify that on day 44 which we did, and we closed about seven days later, right? We 1031 exchange her proceeds of $1.25 million into this DST with a $1.25 million non-recourse loan that she was automatically approved for because she never had to qualify, doesn't show up on a credit report, and she's not legally liable for it. She buys $2.5 million worth of real estate. First property was $4.5. DST was $2.5. She bought $7 million in total real estate. Did she buy more than she sold? Yes. Does she pay any taxes? No. And her income from her DST is $62,000 a year. $100,000 plus her DST, she's making $162,000 a year in total income versus her one thirty she was getting. Okay. Moral of the story is don't call me on day 43. Okay. That's not the moral of the story. Moral of the story is that if, you could, if she could have done proper planning ahead of time, right, and she knew what she was doing here, and she knew what she wanted to get here. We could have been stress-free because we would have lined this up already and we would have replaced the debt for her. Go ahead, sir. Can you talk about top three negative Loss of control. Right? That's what it is. You're turning your active investment passive. And that's it, basically. I own three of them. What, what happens? Does the PST keep going on? Or it has a life which is usually about three to seven years. What happens to the money We're going to sell it at a profit. We're going to return you your principal plus your profit back. And as long as you do a 1031 exchange again, no more taxes. You can 1031 back into physical real estate here in Hawaii, <laughs> something for the kids. You could do both, right? You can do both. Okay. I'll show you other stuff that might sound better, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you go to that property and sure. step in and see? Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> we're like, if, you're think, if you're thinking of staying there like a vacation rental, you cannot really do that. Okay. Um, but if you yeah, I, I have clients, I have clients that do that, believe it or not. Yeah. I have a client in California. I have a client in California who actually does the divorce certification for realtors. Okay. So she contacted me because she knows like this is sort of what we specialize in. And she works with tons of realtors. She 1031 exchanged into a multifamily community in Phoenix, Arizona. And one weekend, she just drove there. She took her husband and said, I want to go see this thing if it's real. <laughs> so she went. Yep. And she said, hey, does so-and-so company own this property? <laughs> what? Well, no. Document. Yeah, yeah. But you know what's funny? If you Google, Google Planet or Google Earth or whatever, Google Map, you can physically see it. It's there. So she physically drove there. She went to the, the management office and said, does so-and-so own this company, um, property? Yes. Do you work for them? Yes, I'm their employee. Would you mind if we look around? I'll give you a tour. So she went. She took a tour of the property. Yeah, so you can do that. Adding to this question, is there any DSP that you know of um, I'm working with a company to hopefully turn the Kapolei Amazon Distribution Center into one. Yeah. And I'm working with a group that we're building a medical project and we're looking to turn that into a DST too. The companies want to buy it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there might be, might be, might be. Okay. Now, <clears throat> how many of you have a mortgage on your primary residence, but not on your investment property? Yeah. Common. 
right? Because we're all taught pay our high interest debt off first, which is always going to be our investment, right? Or sometimes we use the equity from our primary to buy our investment property, right? Okay. So here in this example, here's a, here's one of our clients that had a million dollar property out in Hawaii, Kai, getting 24,000 a year in income from it, 2000 a month net, and has a $180,000 mortgage on his primary residence. Okay. Before he lists the property with Dan and even sells the property, right? What we do is we tell him to go work with his local bank, ASB, BOH, whatever. The banks now are fast on home equity lines because they're slow, right? We'll go work with a local bank, get a home equity line of 250000 As soon as that line is approved, what I want him to do is I want him to take that line of credit, write himself a check for two fifty, dollars pay off the $180,000 mortgage. And from that period on, make only interest only payments for the life of the loan. Home equity lines are interest only payments this way. Okay. Once that is done, we're going to go ahead, pay off the mortgage, no more mortgage payment, and sell the property. Dan then sells the property for a million dollars. The two hundred fifty thousand home equity line is paid off at closing because ASB got to get paid, right? ASB gets paid back to two fifty. We got seven fifty in proceeds, but we need to buy one million in real estate, right? Okay. 1031 exchange into a Delaware statutory trust with a 50% loan to value. And we're going to buy 1.5 million in real estate. Did we buy more real estate than we sold? Are there any taxes? Nope. The DST pays them 37,000 a year in income. The income went up by 23,000 a year, right? But we also reduced his expenses because no more mortgage payment. Now you know why. A lot of baby boomers are looking at the DST for their investment property. Increased income, lower expenses. What does that mean at the end of the day? More money in your pocket, right? And because the 250 was taken out prior to closing, wasn't paid by escrow, wasn't paid by the qualified intermediary, and we bought more real estate than we sold, the 250000 is 100% tax-free. That's the only way you can access your gains in your property tax-free. It's the only way, unless you burn your building down and you keep the insurance check, which I'm still checking on that for you, okay? I'm not saying it's tax-free yet, but I'm still checking on it, okay? Now, <clears throat> how many of you are considering or no family members looking to go to an assisted living facility and worrying how they're going to come up with a deposit, right? That's very common. You guys know how much it costs to go to Kahalanui? $1 million to go in. Actually, a little bit more now. $1 million to go in. Yeah, right. Is it is that now for three, for the three bedroom? Yeah, yeah. Two bedrooms now is like one one, I think, right? One one for the two bedrooms, and it costs about eight thousand a month to stay. Okay, right. So here's an example of a client where her asset, her only asset, was her primary residence. Okay, and she lived in the property her entire life. Four million dollar property, one million dollar mortgage, but for the last two years. She's been living with her kids, going to Arcadia, going to different places because she could no longer live by herself. And that house just stayed vacant for two years. Okay. What we told her to do was <clears throat> we told the kids to co-sign on a $750,000 cash out refinance. And because she lived in the property for two out of the last five years, and it was vacant for two out of the last five years, we're going to use two tax codes. Okay, so we're going to use a section 121 homeowner's exemption, right? That's the one Dan talked about. You sell, you get the first 250 of gain tax free. We're going to use that because that was our primary residence. And we're going to 1031 exchange the balance because it was an investment property for two out of the last five years. At closing, she gets 1 million out of the property. That's her down payment for Kahala. Okay, we 1031 the difference $4 million sales price, $1 million mortgage. One million two hundred fifty thousand because those are primary residents, and we did that additional eight hundred fifty seven hundred fifty thousand cash out refinance. Right, she's left with two million bucks. What do you think we do? Ten thirty one into a fifty percent loan to value DST. Okay, she buys four million in real estate. She didn't buy more real estate than she sold, but she bought the same amount. Still no taxes. Her DST pays her about 100000 a year in income. Now, why is this powerful? Well, originally, the reason why this client came to see me was because her kids wanted to sell the property, pay off the million-dollar mortgage, pay $1 million in taxes, 
take one million, pay the down payment for Kahala, and be left with one million dollars. Okay, and they told me manage the one million dollars so that we can make my mom stay in Kahala Nui because it costs eight thousand a month to stay. Right? How long will that last? Not very long, right? So instead of the kids having to feel like, gosh, I hope mom doesn't stay there very long. If she passes away already, and she's draining all our money, right? We created a way for them to pay for their down payment, have $2 million work for them, still get income, but the kids stand to inherit the $2 million, right? Versus nothing, yeah? And again, because the money was taken out using a cash out refinance and her 121, because it was both, primary residence plus investment for two years, she gets the one million tax free. Okay. Any of you own vacant land? <laughs> if you can if you can tell, okay, if you can tell, John had a property that burned down. So that's why we're just poking fun of him. Right. Silver lining though, you know, Okay, but anyways, th th this is just an example of people that own land. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this might not apply to everybody. But here's a property right next door, right, where the client owns a piece of land with a building on it next door. And she's getting $700,000 a year in income on that property. Bank of Hawaii sends her over to me because they can't help her because she's complaining to them that she's paying too much in taxes. Well, basically what I told her to do was do a cash out refinance of $4.5 million, pay off all her mortgages. Go buy a property at Black Point with cash so she doesn't need to take out another mortgage. 1031 the proceeds into a DST and get 620000 a year. Now, when you look at this first glance, you're going to say, this is crazy. Why would somebody sell this property for $20 million when she's getting 700000 right? But she's paying 380000 in taxes and she's keeping three twenty dollars after taxes. Does that make sense? Okay. And the reason for that is. Vacant land doesn't have a building on it, so there's no depreciation benefits. 100% of that income is all taxable. Okay, So it's never about how much money you make. It's how much money you keep. right? And because now her DST has depreciation, she gets $620,000 a year in income, but she's got $867,000 of depreciation benefits. She pays zero taxes on that income for the rest of her life. And she can use those access excess losses to offset the income taxes on her other rental properties so she's not paying any taxes on those either right she makes 620 and keeps 620 much better right took me 30 minutes to convince her business manager this wasn't tax fraud okay it's legal it's depreciation okay now and again the 4.5 million is taken out tax-free now this is one that i love uh this is an example of how we can utilize multiple tax codes and basically increase someone's income, but also reduce their taxes for the rest of their life on all of their other investments. Okay. Cause how many, what do you think is going to happen to income taxes in the future? Any of you think it's going to go up or down? How many think it's going to go up? Okay. All right. It's going to go up. All right. So this client basically had a property in Koolina that was valued at 1.2 million. She used it for short-term vacation rentals. She was getting 60,000 a year in net rental income. And what she wanted to do was she wanted to take some of the proceeds at closing to go buy a second residence that she would eventually move into. She just wasn't sure when. She knew that last year wasn't the time because of the market. Right? So she wanted to hold on to the cash right? so the market settled down, figure, get more inventory to find something she wants to live in. What's the problem? You cannot 1031 into a primary residence right, or a second home. You need to rent it out for two years first and then you can move in. Okay. So instead, what I told her to do was 1031 exchange her proceeds into something called an UPREIT or an Umbrella Partnership Real Estate Investment Trust. Okay. And what it is in step one, it's a DST. So she 1031s into a DST. And in the 25th month, this property that's a DST gets part of a bigger fund called a Real Estate Investment Trust. And this real estate investment trust is about $4 billion in size, 140 different pieces of real estate in there. And in exchange for her building, she gets shares and she gets income. So now it's like it turns into a mutual fund. You guys don't know what a mutual fund is, right? Yeah. Right? But when she's in the UPREIT, there's a unique tax code attached to this. Okay. And in the 37th month, 
at year number three, she's able to utilize a 131 partnership exchange. And what that allows her to do is take out her cost basis. Okay. Real estate is always taxed last in, first out. Right. She bought this property for seven hundred thousand. Now it's worth one point two million. If she sells it for one point two million, every dollar she takes, at least for the first five hundred thousand, is all gained first. Right? She gets tax on that. Once she pays all the taxes on all her gains and she hits seven hundred thousand, okay, she can get all that back tax free because that's her original investment. Okay. With a one thirty one partnership exchange, we flip it in the thirty seventh month. She can take her cost basis out tax free, first in, first out. She puts seven hundred thousand in first. She can take all that out tax free, as long as she leaves the five hundred thousand back in this mutual fund. She'll never pay a penny in taxes on it. Okay, so what happens? She takes out her seven hundred thousand. Now she can buy anything she wants with it. She can go buy her home and move in immediately. Does that make sense? Okay, but. The minute she touches a penny in that five hundred thousand, she's gonna pay taxes, right? Because that's all gain left. Does that make sense? Okay. But if we take it a step further, I can teach her how to take this tax bomb, which is one hundred percent taxable, and teach her how to turn it into a tax blessing. I can teach her how to turn it into a tax deduction. Okay. And this is how we do it. We're gonna create what we call a charitable remainder unit trust. And we're going to donate this 500000 of gain to a, to a trust that we create that she's a trustee of and she identifies charities that she likes, Ronald McDonald House, Salvation Army, UH Foundation, whatever. Right? We put these people on here, and when she makes her $500,000 donation, she'll get a 263000 income tax deduction. Now, what are you going to do? With, any of you make more than 263000 a year? No. How do we how do we use that income tax deduction? We can't use it. You guys ever heard of an IRA to Roth conversion? Any of you owns IRAs? Right? Your IRA money is 100% taxable, right? There's a way to turn it 100% tax free. You do a IRA to a Roth conversion. But what's the problem? You got to pay the taxes today. Right? And in 2018, the tax reform allowed us to basically unlimited conversion amounts. Right, We can con convert any amount of IRA money to Roth as long as we pay the tax. doesn't matter if we're working, if we're not working, what age we are, whatever. Okay, So what do we do? We convert 263000 of our IRA money to Roth IRA without paying any tax because it's a wash. She claimed the income on the 263, but she gets the income tax deduction offsets the tax okay her trust though will still pay her income pay her 25,000 a year for the rest of her life a lot of people think that when you give money to charity you can't get anything back when you structure it correctly like this no nope, she gets income for life okay she'll draw out about 586,000 in income for her lifetime and she'll leave back 604,000 for charity Okay, so what happened in this case? We we're able to bypass the capital gains of five hundred thousand. We saved her ninety four thousand in taxes. We took her income. If she left it in the mutual fund, it would have been twenty. She got her twenty five. She gets to convert one hundred percent taxable dollars to one hundred percent tax free. But she got access to her cost basis of seven hundred thousand, one hundred percent tax free in the thirty seventh month. You like that better, Ken? Okay. Uh, okay. So th this is, I'm a, I, I geek out on this stuff. Like I love this stuff. Yeah. But this concept here, I, I'm actually going to say I created it. Okay. I've done charitable plan giving for 13 years. Um, I've worked with you very close with UH foundation. Um, so I, I, I was, I, I was privileged to learn from the executive director of my coppice over there before he retired. And a lot of my clients have donated real estate to UH, you know, for, for this reason, right? So because we specialize in holistic wealth management and we work with many tax professionals, CPAs, estate attorneys, charitable attorneys to create all these documents and we provide the vehicle, it's fun leveraging different tax codes, right? So this was something we created. And I know 
that P the investment world doesn't know about this yet. Because when I asked the upread companies, how many of your accounts actually have a physical owner being a charitable trust? So far in the entire US, there's one. No, 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 it checks all the boxes. It's legal. It's legal. Yeah. It's legal. It checks all the boxes. No, it checks all the boxes, but good, good, good one, John. But, um, <laughs> um, but as you can see, there's many different ways you can use the DST, right? And proper planning, proper planning. That is the key, right? Sitting down, looking at your situation, creating a proper plan to map out whether what what, what you want to happen with your real estate, your life, whatever it is, whether it's eliminating your mortgage, increasing your rate of return, being more tax efficient, not only when you sell, but also when you own your asset, right? Simplifying your life. That's the bigger one. Silver, that's the biggest, right? That's why we're so busy. Everyone's looking for ways to simplify their life. I don't want to deal with the tenants to all this trash anymore. Right? Um, and of course, right, providing a more tax risk and fair estate plan. Um, because minimize the conflict, minimize the fighting, keep it fair. Right? And of course, it never makes sense to pay the tax. Never makes sense to pay the tax. Okay. And I think it's Dan's turn now. Any questions before we go on? What do you guys think? Mind blowing, right? Mind -blowing. Last question on the, um, the DST for your GEP and your state tax. No, no state of Hawaii general excise tax because the property is not in Hawaii. So oh. done. No state of Hawaii GE anymore. The 4.71 gone. If the property is in a state that has state income taxes, your CPA needs to file a return in that state, which is like 15, 20 bucks. You got to pay, you got to pay Hawaii because you're a Hawaii resident, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if the property is located in Arizona, we got to file an Arizona return. That's one form from your CPA. We give him all the information he plugs on there. They normally charge 20 bucks for that form. And because of depreciation, usually no more taxes. You don't need to have debt on the property, but many times if you don't have debt, it might make sense to add it. Okay. Right, gives you a way to access your gains today tax free. We can mix and match debts of the DSTs to match that. We have some DSTs that have debt like 77% loan to value, 35, 40, zero, right? We can mix and match the, pro the debt so that we match your debt level so you'll never have to pay a penny in taxes. Mm -hmm. Sir? Property in Las Vegas to a good value of service and what is not a good area in Las Vegas? That's the question. <laughs> Actually, I just came from Las Vegas. Um, there are, there, there, yeah, we both are actually there independently. Is wild. We travel a lot. No. <laughs> hey John, ours they committed to us it was four point three as a return. It's now four point four nine. Does that come every month? Every month. Every month it shows up. It's passive income. Yeah. I mean, Well, Troy's going to be here for a little bit after we're done.
Oh, Enrique's going to be a choice. He's got to go. Oh, right on. Okay, Zach. Okay, Zach. See you later, buddy. Thanks, Troy. <clears throat> yes, Donald. Oh, I'll, I'll take that offline. We'll, we'll talk some more. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk some more. So what are, what are the benefits of the 1031 exchange? Just recapping, deferring capital gains taxes. That's your number one enemy to building wealth, right? State and federal levels. Uh, you do have to apply all the proceeds to the replacement property. What's good about the 1031 exchange is you can involve multiple properties. You don't have to sell one to buy one, right? You could sell one to buy three. You can sell three to buy two. You can mix and match. It really doesn't matter. The most challenging one we had is we sold five properties in four states to buy one here in Hawaii. Yeah, that's that's hence all the gray hair. Uh, please don't do that to me. But <laughs> it is possible to do. It is definitely possible to do. And you need a strong plan to do that, right? And it allows you to create greater diversity from your assets or consolidating things. So you can separate assets or you can bring them back. We have one client that had 15 properties and dad was 90 years old and they said, oh my gosh, we got to bring all these things back to Hawaii. So we started selling them in buckets of five and then we brought the asset back to Hawaii because that's where the kids wanted it, right? Um, so it just depends on what your situation is and when we meet, that's kind of how we figure that out. And it's a great estate planning tool for sure. So is it a good time to do a 1031 exchange? Yes, if you have a lot of equity in it, if you want to upgrade or increase your portfolio, right? If you want to relocate the asset, what if you want to make, you want to have an asset somewhere where your kids or grandkids are going to school? We've got clients doing that today. That They're going to have someplace they're going to own as an investment property and now their kid doesn't have to rent something they can stay in grandma and grandpa's place, right? So relocating is a big way of how to help family out um, for that, helping family out and then creating a financial plan and creating a legacy. Because at the end of the day, money is good for the good it does. So what good do you want it to do? And this is how we help folks reallocate their wealth to what matters most to them. And then you can also pull cash out, as you saw in the example. We do a lot of that. Well, somebody needs cash. They don't have the cash. We're pulling a HELOC out, which is tax-free money to pay off debt, to pay off their mortgage. Somebody who's actually buying long-term care insurance. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with the cash that's in your property, right? And so being having that as a flexible option as we go into a 50% loan to value or, or, or something of that nature in a DST really helps people get to their goal faster. So why should you have a plan? Because has anybody heard of a family who fought over real estate after mom and dad died? Anybody? <laughs> why does that happen? Why does that happen? Well, it happens because, you know, the, the real Akamai family is they have a trust, right? And you put it in a trust, and what does the trust says? Upon my demise, the kids have to deal with it. So I ask all of you, are all your kids alike? Most people say no. Do, you, do they think alike? No. Do they act alike? Are they in the same economic phase of life? If the answer is no to any of those questions, you have a time bomb waiting to happen. What you're doing is you're putting them in, you're putting in the trust and then they get it upon your demise. And at that point in time, you're gone. You're gone. And now real wealth shows up in their mind. This is the most amount of wealth they've ever seen in their life. And they don't agree. How's that going to work out? Hence, we have fights. Hence, we do family <laughs> dispute resolution now because of these problems. Our goal and our, our movement in real estate is a real estate planner community around the country is to get in front of those problems, to help families stay together, not fall apart over money through real estate. And that's why we do what we do. We're so passionate about this. I travel two weeks out of the year now just to travel to train real estate agents around the country how to do what we do because it matters. We're changing lives every day. Talking about family, family feud um, prevention plan, helping them understand, their, we first understand their family dynamics, then we understand their needs, then we understand their trust document, then we create a plan to help them pass on wealth and minimize taxes and alleviate the problems or burdens of the real estate, and therefore we minimize family disputes. 
on our conversations that we have, you know, we believe in the power of curiosity over judgment, right? That a self-guided discovery can instill forward movement for families. And this is what we're doing today around the country. We're helping families stay together. We're helping them process the real estate. I'm going to leave you with one last story of something that's very common. <clears throat> um, mom's a widow, and she has three, four kids. And in this example, mom has an apartment building. We'll just call it a million dollars for round numbers. Right? And mom doesn't want that apartment building. Mom, mom doesn't want anything to do with it. She has more money than she'll spend. She doesn't need the money from it. Actually, it's not generating much money. Um, it's a burden. She's got to pay property taxes. She's got to pay income taxes off the income. She's just got all these things. And at her age, she doesn't want to deal with it anymore. But back in the day when she built wealth, she ran it herself. She was her own property manager. She did everything. But in some point in our life, we're going to say, poho, as my mom would say, no need, right? It's time to move on. How do we change this? So mom comes to one of our classes and she says to the kids, hey, there's a way we can eliminate the burden, eliminate tax, eliminate family disputes, and bless you guys today while you're alive. So she brings all the four kids around the family. We sit and talk and we talk about what if they had an opportunity to predetermine their inheritance, would you? And they're all excited. Wow, I get to predetermine my inheritances, which would be a fourth of it, which that's what the trust would have normally said. But what if you could do it today? What if you could have $250,000 today from this asset use of, use of, right? So mom sells that property. She buys four of these all around the country, and she keeps it in her name. The cool thing about this is uh, George says, I want to buy more than $250,000. I have another $100,000. I want to buy up to three fifty. dollars He can do that. He can co-own it with mom. Mom still does her 1031 exchange, removes all of her burdens, and guess what? He would never have been able to buy that without mom's help changing his family's life for generations to come. He's now a homeowner when in the past he wouldn't have been able to been a homeowner. Right? All these properties stay in mom's name. When mom passes away, we work with a trust attorney that upon mom's demise, all these properties go to these children tax free. You get a step up in cost basis, zero capital gains tax. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what's impacted so many families and lives around the country today because we're now educating people of how do you use your real estate to areas that matter most to you. So 10 things to make good sound decisions. Number one, understand current market analysis. Number two, understand interest rate chart and how that works. Three is doing an equity analysis on your properties, right? And doing a tax liability assessment, understanding what that's going to look like. Completing a, a, a portfolio assessment, doing an asset performance test on all of your assets and compare it to what it could look like. Helping you with your, your property where it would be renovation and repair work, whatever it may be. It could be in your own home. We can do that too. Right? Um, building wealth, um, generational wealth by teaching the next generation how to be responsible individuals. How do you build wealth? Right, And now we're helping kids and their grandkids now of, of the vision of home ownership, of a vision of building wealth over time, and, and the use of the compounding value chart. And lastly, family feud dis, dis, uh, resolution. Getting in front of it is really important, but sometimes it's too late, and sometimes bad's already existing, and our job is to go in and, and, and remove those problems for folks. Right? So what you might want to do is create a plan. So what is a real estate planner? We think like a consultant, act like a shepherd, and focus all of our activities on the needs of the family as it builds and transfers wealth through real estate. You know, our mission is to build a community of real estate planners all over the country that facilitate conversations just like this, provide solutions, and execute plans to build generational wealth and accomplish the goals of the family. Here's the cool thing, ladies and gentlemen. You, if you own real estate, you have the power in your own hands of how you're going to manage this and plan it. And then you get to be the architect of your own plan. Right? 
versus being the victim of your kids fighting when you're gone, right? That's what we want to do. So if, if any of this was overwhelming or any of this you think you want to have a, a private conversation around, uh, today we have Justice, raise your hand, Justice, and Julie, my wife Julie. See them. They have some times available. Trey and I travel half the month each because we're, we're training all over the country now. So there are times available, uh, but not every day is available. So if you'd like, you can feel free to meet them, uh, put it on the calendar, check your calendar. Um, and, and if you don't have your calendar, you can always call us back, but it's probably better to put it on before it's too late. Uh, and then feel free to grab a gift here from us. Um, so include this is that for our presentation. Any questions that we can help with? 